Hello, everyone. It's Vivian from the Religion and Popular Culture podcast. I'm just dropping in at the beginning of this episode to let you know that this one was recorded while all together live at the British Association for the Study of Religion conference. Basically, what that means is while we normally record a remote, this time we were all in the same room gathered around a microphone. While that was very exciting for us, it means that the recording quality is not normally as high as it typically would be, but hopefully you enjoy it all the same. So that's it. Enjoy the episode. Welcome to the Religion and Popular Culture podcast, where we talk about religion, popular culture, and everything in between. I am your anthropologist of religion, Vivian Asimos, and I'm here with the sociologist with the most theologist, Alan Thomas. Alan, how are you? I'm very well, Vivian, the anthropologist with the most theologist. <laughs> it doesn't quite work. No, it doesn't. For the anthropology. Well, I we, we shouldn't blab for too long because we're not alone. No, we're not. Um, there's an intruder. There's an intruder in the mix. <laughs> <laughs> So we are here with Paul Francois Tremlett. Paul, would you like to introduce yourself? I guess I must be a sociologist or the sociologist as well. Yes. Um, and maybe, I don't know, I've done a bit of anthropology too, um, and I'm really delighted to be here with you two. Um, I've been listening to your podcast, I've really enjoyed it. Um, yeah. Shoot. <laughs> Paul is a good friend of the podcast. And Very a good, good friend. And a good friend of ours as well. Yeah. Um, so one of the, the things that we decided to do is we are actually together in the same room for the first time in a yes, while. In I'm sitting time. next to Alad. Yes, not staring at me on a Zoom <laughs> screen. Yeah, we're trying not to breathe too heavily in case the COVID particles are still real. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, sure, <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> as we gather around a microphone. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Up as close as possible, get close to the microphone, but don't breathe. <laughs> well, so we, we brought in Paul for a very specific reason, and that is that Paul has an intense interest in board games. I do like playing board games. And we have not talked about board games on this podcast yet. No, we have not. So this is your chance. This is, is our chance. You are our gateway. Okay, I guess... Would you like to tell us your experience of board games? Um, I guess like you, you uh, I started off playing uh, board games with my mum and dad and my brother, and I just loved playing board games. I loved the, the, the sort of intimacy of playing games together. I mean, there were games like Cluedo and Monopoly. Uh, my dad tried to teach me chess. He failed to teach me chess. Um, <laughs> That's a different kind of game, perhaps. But yeah, it's. I grew up playing board games. They were family occasions, playing cards as well. Just games um, are a great way to get people together to suspend the the the, the, all the real, the so-called real world, right? And put it, put it, put it aside for a bit. Get together, and uh, I don't know. Maybe you're gonna compete with each other for a prize. Maybe you're all going to collaborate together to defeat the game itself. Well, there's a lot of contemporary games like that, Pandemic and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, I just love playing board games. I think it's great fun. It's great to do. And um, tell me your favorite board game. Oh, my favorite board game. Um, well, I we've been getting into a lot of two-player board games because I have a partner in my life. Uh, who loves board games, grew up playing intense... I mean, for me, I grew up playing, like, Monopoly or Sorry kind of board games, but he grew up playing board games. Um, (laughs) Which, for for people who aren't into board games, there is a distinction between board games and board games. I think you should open that distinction (laughs) out. Well, so I think that it's kind of like the uh, video game, like, filthy casual uh, mentality, where if you kind of play, uh, in, a, in Britain it's called Cluedo, but for our American listeners, Clue. If you grow up playing just kind of Clue and Monopoly and, and that's it, then you're kind of the 
that's not that's not really playing board games. But if you grow up playing like Catan, uh, then maybe you're a bit more of like a board game family. Right. So <laughs> if you haven't played Carcassonne, you can't really call it exactly. And I think that that would be the distinction is like that kind of basic uh, mainstream family board games versus like once you go to like a board game cafe and the types of board games that they have there versus. I do love the board games. Yes, yeah, so I was going to say you're very the one in Nottingham. I Nugurati think you... is just a fantastic board game cafe, but other board game cafe. Are are available. Available. <laughs> We're not the BBC. You don't have to. <laughs> <laughs> a really good one in Oxford as well, uh, which, uh, yeah, anyway, there's loads of them, isn't there? Yeah, yeah, I just went to one in Bristol, which was was very nice, and we got to try out some board games that we weren't sure whether or not we wanted to, to pay for, so we were like, well, we'll test it out here, so we kind of got to do that. Alan, what's your experience with board games? Well, I'm going to make myself sound a bit of a normie, because I do love some Cluedo. <laughs> there's nothing wrong with <laughs> Cluedo. Cluedo is You're just great. a filthy casual. I yes. And I have I have a particularly fond memory. My wife refuses to play it with me, so maybe me and you should yes. sit down and have a you know very competitive the, game. The, the poirot mustaches. <laughs> <laughs> whenever whenever someone says that a partner refuses to play a specific a board story game with them, that. there is a reason. <laughs> I was about to say I have a very fond memory of an especially intense game of Cluedo. But the first Christmas I ever spent with my wife, we played Cluedo with my parents, and. My parents were really going head to head to find the killer, and um, yeah, it's 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 a happy memory. It was as Paul was saying, it was a communal event. It was a chance for my parents to get to know my wife and so on. Um, but I'll also add, I am always, always Professor Plum. Without fail. <laughs> Without fail. Ever since I was a little boy. It's always trying Plum. to be a professor. Always the purple, and yes, sadly, always trying to be a professor. <laughs> Right. Is that strange? What, always wanting to be Professor Plum? Yeah. Or, right. or picking a particular character every time, because my father is always the dog in Monopoly. Right. Is it unusual to have a favourite piece in these? So, I, I, this is, I was not planning on talking about this today, but... And my, my, well, <laughs> this is always, how these podcasts go. <laughs> there's always a weird thing whenever I start talking about my husband or my husband's family on this podcast, because he does listen to this podcast, and every once in a while he's like, oh yeah, I heard that you said that, and it's like, ugh. Um, but he grew up in a family where each of... Because he it's him and three other siblings, there's four of them, and they each had a colour. So they, it was like, you know, that was the color of your everything. So it was to designate what was for each child as they grew up. Is that because they played board games? <laughs> Did they always pick the same color? I, mean, the I color think that's fascinating. Children is quite weird. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Luckily, I don't think my mother-in-law listens to this, so I think we'll be fine. <laughs> time, to, time for bed, Red. <laughs> But uh, side note to Tom, if you're listening to this, remind me to talk to you about that. <laughs> so your favourite game as a kid is Cluedo. I would say as a kid, and I have to give a special shout out to Game of Thrones Monopoly, which we played mm. a few years ago because I had a community <laughs> chess card that simply said Hodo, and I, I laughed for hours. So it was worth the purchase alone just for that. But Monopoly's good, time consuming. But my wife and I mostly play video games. See, so I, I grew up with my dad playing Risk with us. So time consuming was definitely part of it. And and my parents were divorced. We were only there for like, you know, a day and a half every so often. So we would have his dining room table would just be the Risk board. And then we would leave for a whole week and then come back to try to finish the game. And we'd have to analyze to see if he moved the pieces. <laughs> Course. Because this is how much we trust things, I guess. But um, now I play a lot more of the, the board gamey board games with my partner. And one of my favorite ones is Seven Wonders Duel, which is probably one of the best two-player board games I think I've ever played. It's very detailed and very interesting and very competitive to where we might be feeling in the moment like it's an actually like even game and then we'll count up the scores and he has slaughtered me. Um, you know, it's kind of one of those, or one person will be feeling like, oh, I'm, you know, this game sucks, I'm, I'm 
just dying the whole time like I'm not doing well and then we'll count up the scores and and it's actually quite even and I think it's a good game for that of never never really feeling like uh, oh well this one person's just gonna win the whole time because then you kind of get dejected and oh, I don't really feel like playing anymore but maybe I'm just always <laughs> so focused on winning that if I'm not gonna win I don't want to play <laughs> Yeah, I mean, who, who wants to lose all the time? What about Talisman? I have not played Talisman. No, I've not played Talisman. It's a sort of board game version of Dungeons and Dragons, and you choose characters from you know ogre through to you know high mage and various options, and then you progress through the levels. You acquire spells and strength and power. And then you reach the throne of power, having overcome various obstacles and difficulties, and then you kill all the other players. <laughs> <It's> super. <laughs> I um that this reminds me you were saying about gaming, perhaps um, or board. Would you say gaming for board games? Yeah. I normally associate the word gaming with video games, but you say it could be a collaborative endeavor and so on. I once got Vivian to give a guest talk to my students about video games and just the concept of games in general and we had one particular student who couldn't grasp the concept of any game that didn't involve him potentially oh. winning yeah that was it was the whole thing was about competition with him and it was if so there wasn't hard a competitive to get element him. then it wasn't even a game it yeah wasn't a, a game can be many things i don't want to be too Wittgenstein about it and um, but I mean, but that's interesting yes. in and of itself <laughs> that that was a conception of because I mean, and for that one, we were even extrapolating it to all play, and he kept focusing on the competitive side of of play, and I kept trying to be like, well, what about this or this that are? There's loads of collaborative games, aren't there? Mm. I think Fury of Dracula, where you run around Europe trying to capture Dracula and and, and, and kill him, and then there's loads of ones sort of. Lovecraftian cosmic horror games where you're trying to work together to prevent, you know, eruptions of madness and insanity from overthrowing the entire world. Um, they're fantastic, and you're you're working together against the game itself. The game is basically your opponent. Um, I think I don't remember those kinds of games as a kid. I, I remember mm. comp in, you know, as an individual competing against. Uh, you know, the games were all individuals competing against the other players. Uh, so these seems to be a, a sort of new kind of game design with, with where collaboration is a really strong element. Uh, there's some really great games out there. Now we had a, a in our first, well, I guess technically second season of this, um, we had an episode where we talked about nostalgia and religion. But I think in that we focused a lot more on things like music and TV shows and... And, and Christmas as well. Yeah, yeah, we talked about all that stuff, but we didn't, I don't, we didn't mention board games. We didn't mention, mm. or even video, well, I think we might have mentioned video games, but um, we, we didn't really talk about, I think, that more active side of it. But you kind of vaguely reminiscing while also talking about it does yeah, I seem mean, a bit, yeah. Yeah, no, for me, um, games are a big part of my childhood and, uh, you know, growing up, and it was bringing people, you know, people come together to play the game together, you know, and invest in it, invest their time and, and, and enjoyment, and that, that's it's like a, it's a, it's a really important thing to do with your family and your friends. Um, yeah, I, I love that stuff. What you're saying about it being in person is really important, because I was just reflecting on the amount of Animal Crossing that you, I, your husband, my wife all play together, but we've never been in the same room. Mm. And while that was lovely during lockdown and so forth, it's never quite the same as what's known in gaming as couch co-op. Yeah. <laughs> Tell me more about couch co-op. Well, couch co-op is a dying breed because everything is online now, uh, which is great because I get to keep in touch with friends from Wales, for example, by shooting them in the head online. But <laughs> <laughs> no, a true way of connecting <laughs> which, with friends. Which, which, is, which is wonderful. But when I grew up, I, I was... I wasn't about board games, I was about video games. And it was all about couch co-op. Four people, four controllers, GoldenEye on the Nintendo 64. Hours of fun. Incredibly archaic by modern standards. I went to the Cambridge, um, I can't remember the name of it, but it was a museum of computing, but it was specifically about video games. They had a video game evening. And uh, they had a Nintendo 64 with four controllers, GoldenEye, plugged into an old Scar TV. And I sat, Victoria Dan would never play this, and I said... This, this, you will not believe how great this is. And I played two minutes of it, and it was crazy.
crap. <laughs> and, and, and I think that's the problem is that I think Paul could. <laughs> I think I. Well, Paul could get out a video, a video game, a board game from his childhood, for example, and we could probably have the same amount of fun with it. But video games, if you, we even had a conversation about this this morning with Zelda games about oh, yeah, the yeah. old Zelda games that we can't bear playing anymore. Because well, they just you handled. said you couldn't bear playing anymore. Yes. I need to stress. Well, I was fine with them. <laughs> but they, because of the archaic design and so forth, that technology's moved on and you think, oh, well, this game plays so much more efficiently now and so on. But I think, I guess with board games, the the objects that you have don't really go out of style, do they? Well, unless we're talking about the top hat uh, in, in the novel or Professor but the top hat the, <laughs> I, I, I said that with such disdain I'm, I'm so, sorry to be so video gamey about it but it's the same mechanic as it's known and board game mechanics they're, they're just as good don't they there's a timeless quality to board games mm. that sadly we don't have in some video games GoldenEye was great in 1997 I was embarrassed <laughs> to have hyped it up so much to my wife when she sat down and looked at it and thought you think this is great? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Hundreds of hours on this thing. <laughs> Miss Van Dieuth. Right. Is that the film, Goldeneye? Yes, and there was a there was a video game based on it that revolutionised first person shooters, so particularly just... because of the four player. Yeah, it was. Game. I mean, it was huge for a while in because 1990. You had two player <laughs> video games, and then you had four player video games, and they divide the screen into four screens, and you would be a variety of James Bond characters, and you would just go at each other, and it was endlessly fun. Incredibly archaic compared to something like Overwatch, which I play with my friends online now. Um, that's it. Happy times. <laughs> See, now, now I'm now I'm being drawn into. Yeah. Well, and, yes. and there is something interesting though about the the video game board game, and I know we brought you on to talk about board games, and suddenly we're talking about video games for a while. But there's a, a board game that I played with my husband's family um, one Christmas, and I think anyway we played it together, and I really really loved it. But it's a four player game, and so it's not something that me and my partner looked into getting for each other because. We don't have two people coming over to the house very often. We don't like people. So we we didn't get a four-player game. But I, I really loved it. So we found out that they had just put out a video game version of the board game on Switch. So we mm. bought it and we've been doing we've been doing some couch co-op. You can set the other two players to just be computers that run, and you pass and play. You can also do it online, but we, um, we've we just been doing it. You know, we'll just pass the controller when it's the person's turn. Mm. And it's been really interesting to think about the different mechanics and, and how it works differently between the board game to the video game versus it being, I don't know, it's, it's, it's been interesting. Mm. Have you played Ticket for Ride? Ticket to Ride, where you build railways around different parts of the world and create routes and... I mean, it's a competitive game, but there's also online versions, and you can play on your own. And um, I know that my wife plays on her own rather than with me. <laughs> there, <laughs> I'm seeing the theme. theme. <laughs> <laughs> we will talk about the different themes coming up, and I think that's one of them. But I, this, this is... This is uh... So any competitive game, she doesn't want to play with you, I'm seeing. <laughs> But this does make me think you were talking about board games in your childhood so much. But I follow you on Instagram, and I follow your Thank wife God. on Instagram, and I know that you both like playing board games. That board game apparently not on. together. Apparently not together now. But so is it an important part of your adult life as well? Is it important? If you don't mind me asking. I mean, no, no, not at all. Of course, I wouldn't be here if I. I, I love going out to a board game cafe and and, and you know just. A four four hours just disappearing in a, in a game. Uh, I, I love that. I I've been playing Dungeons and Dragons since I was uh, a teenager with the same group of people. Um, and anyone who knows me knows that me when I was a teenager was quite a long time ago now. And, we, and, and I guess I don't know if that's strictly a board game, but the point is, board games uh, creates you know threads through your life. You know, you can tell your 
tell a little bit of his story about about the people you have significant relationships with in terms of the people you like to sit around the table and and, and, and play games with, right? So yeah, these these things are really massively important to me. I, I love playing games, um, and I think um, yeah, I love playing games. <laughs> <laughs> This is what we're calling these podcast descends into, isn't it? Yeah, this is this is what happens oh. is we just end up talking about oh, things, things that we, that we love. Mm. Yeah, yeah. But this is the religion and popular culture podcast. So one of the things that I thought was interesting was when I when I learned about your love of board games um, was when you sent a thing of hey I'm gonna maybe request this funding to maybe do some research on board games and I went oh okay. And I didn't realize that you were coming from someone who already knew a lot about it and a love for it. But Insider, I, outsider. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. It, I, it was something that I hadn't really thought about. So I was wondering if you would mind talking a little bit about the more kind of how does religious studies or the approach of any kind of study of religion, how does that connect to board games? Yeah, okay. So I think there's a couple of... We can, we can approach that in a couple of different ways. Um, I think play... Uh, and the ludic, if you like, is something that's um, related to ritual, it's related to performance um, and improvisation. And I think, you know, there's a, there's a, there are conversations in religious studies uh, around performance and ritual and stuff. Um, and playing games is part of that conversation. So I think then there's, as I was, as we've all been talking about earlier, how important games are with significant others in our lives. There's a that, that's, you know, there's a strong ritual dimension, if you like, yeah, to that as well. I think, um, and one of the but one of the things that I was trying to do uh, in, in that proposal was to think about also whether board games could be vehicles to. Um, help people learn more about uh, religion. There are lots of board games out there that have st strong religious... Uh, 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 tell a story about religions in different ways. So, for example, um, uh, I don't know if either of you played Civilization before. It's an intensely technologically deterministic game. Um, and, you know, religion appears at a particular moment as you develop your society. Uh, and it has certain effects uh, going, you know, that, that are beneficial going forward to to help you build your state and build your empire and, and so on and so forth. It, it's like they just read some, you know, E.B. Tyler or something. Or, or, you know. I wouldn't be surprised. Long, We've long, talked about Tyler term, quite long, a lot. Yeah, long-term listeners of the show would know that this isn't a particularly <laughs> big... Friend of the pod, Tyler. <laughs> yeah, he's not a friend of the pod. <laughs> I'm not bringing him up because I think he's a. I mean, I don't think he's a, a bad guy. He was a bad guy or anything. He's, uh, but the, the, the point being that. Well, I mean, I don't know. He was a white dude in the 1800s. He probably was a bad guy. Let's be honest. Well, he, you know, he was a Quaker who suffered religious discrimination in his own way. Uh, he couldn't go to university, even though he was from a fairly well-to-do background, and yet he became. Um, first professor of anthropology at Oxford. Yeah, he had quite a, an interesting life. I mean, for sure, he, he, he was, um, didn't, didn't really reflect on his privilege. Let's, let's put it that way. Um, yeah, but yeah, it's, his story, yeah, his story is quite complex. Um, anyway. And in what ways, sorry to bring you back to him, but in what ways do you see him coming through in these games that you just mentioned? Well, no, it's not that he's coming through, it's just that in civilization they've taken that idea of society as progressing in stage by stage, mm -hmm. and that religion plays a point up to a point, and then it's, mm -hmm. it's science all the way. That technological determinism that you get in civilization is, is basically saying, look, uh, is telling a particular story about religion, right? So if we want to, if we wanted to design a game to encourage people to to become more, um, to enhance or amplify people's religious literacy, we wouldn't design a game like that, would we? I mean, we've got a particular view of where Tyler belongs in the history of our field, right? And 
I, I think we will share that view. And, and so, how how could we design a game that could encourage a more sophisticated uh, grasp of of how religions are involved in the history of our of, of, our, of us? You know, if we're talking about big history, or perhaps more specifically, how can we get children playing games uh, uh, that have religion, religious elements in schools that could help them learn about different... I was going to ask about pedagogy yeah. and so it, the idea of a board game as a teaching tool. Cause that could be of, quite nice. There's actually quite a lot of research on computer games uh, and, that, and that area, but much less... On, on board games there there is a um a group of people doing this is much more um tabletop role playing i guess if we're going to draw a distinction between board games and that which is already kind of fuzzy but um my my phd supervisor was quite involved in in it where he was starting to teach people through doing essentially tabletop role playing games uh, i don't think he quite realized that that's what he was doing but that's what he was doing. And I ended up teaching um, a module on Islam and the anthropology of Islam using a tabletop role-playing game where basically each of the um, students in the class got assigned a character from when Egypt was going for independence. And there was a lot of conversation about politics and religion and how these intersect and the history of Islam and how that intersects with all of this. And um, the interpretations of the Quran that each person had, and it was all very complicated and nuanced, and each person had their own view of things, despite there being all these people, and they were in factions together. So it was a nice way of saying these people were allies, but they actually saw things slightly differently from one another. But it, we ended up playing it out where we just said, okay, you each have these people, and here are your goals, and then we'll just do it. And they were having conversations, and they were having arguments, and uh, they didn't realize that there was a whole nother faction that was slowly building an army in the desert. And so there was suddenly civil war going on, and um, how, I mean, this this all ended up not being historically accurate at all by the end of it, but it was interesting to see how they engaged with it. And there were legitimate arguments about, you know, that they were having about, well, this aspect of the Quran and how that impacts politics and how that impacts the way that I understand gender and, and all of these things. And the students were having a difficult time in, in figuring out their own views versus the views of their person that they were supposed to be portraying and navigating that. But I think that they really learned a lot about that point in time, but also how religion can impact these conversations in our contemporary era as well. So there is some people doing that, but it's a very slow movement. Yeah, I mean, be, I mean, if you know, when if and when there's feedback, right? It'd be great to hear what if people have been part of classes like that, or if people have run classes like that, and, and what the sort of what the response has been, because that, that I think that sounds really interesting. Yeah, I mean, it was it was a lot of fun to, and I, I it was weird because I got brought onto this class not because I'm an expert in Islam, but because I am I know how to run a tabletop role playing game. Mm. Um, and so I was uh, being able to kind of have run communication between different groups secretly and rolling for things. So that way random stuff would happen. If someone was like, oh, I want to do this. So I'd be like, well, let's roll for it and see whether or not it'll happen. And there was one person um, who ended up being attacked uh, from an assassination, which I don't think was supposed to happen, but whatever. And he was in a coma and I kept rolling to see if he would wake up from his coma. And he was getting so mad the longer he stayed in the coma. <laughs> Um, but it was like those kinds of, of activities that were, to them, I'm sure, just like, why are we even doing this in a class? But at the same time, they were learning about all of these mm. things. So. I didn't realize you were a DM as well. <laughs> I mean, my, not an immensely skilled one, I should specify. I find this aspect of board games really interesting because I wanted to mention imagination. Because you said earlier there was a board game where you chased Dracula around Europe. Yeah. How, how how does that look on the boards? Do you have a little Dracula figurine? Yeah, or? there's figures. But the point is you can't see where Dracula is. You okay. have to work out his location through the clues his activities will be behind. Right. See, now, I don't know if I'm being a spoiled millennial here, but I don't know if video games have warped my... Or rather, nerfed to use a video game term, nerfed my imagination. Because maybe yes, because, because yeah, because I, was yeah, about to say, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I mean, I, I, I do love video games, and I, my, I my... find it more immersive than the, you know, Professor Plum is just a is just a 
plum. You should play colored figurine. <laughs> you, you know, he doesn't even have a hairdo. It's it's just a. It's just. It's, it's not. It, it's mean, really difficult to it's describe. It's supposed it? to be realistic. Yes. <laughs> no, I know, but <laughs> and, and so many of the video games I play aren't. The but didn't happen. No, but now, well, now we are now we are spoiling. Well, the it fun. happened in a ballroom. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I I think you might be interested to play a board game with a board game fanatic group of people. Yes. Yes. Because the... yeah, because I mean, I and I, again, I grew up playing those that the the base games. Uh, but I I grew up playing those kinds of games, and I had a very you know board games are all right, but whatever kind of view of it. And then I played with my husband's family. <laughs> Mm-hmm. And that was a very different experience. And it's it's not so much a my imagination shifted because my brain works um, in a way that it's not visual. So I don't imagine things in that sense. But when you have the group fervor, and I think that's more of, of yes. what you get sucked into is if everyone's going, oh, but Dracula, kind of like the, we played a game last night. Yes, yes. I, I mean, it was, a, it was a trivia game, but me, you, and Paul were way too into it. <laughs> 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 Paul was not on Alan and mine's team, but we were making faces at each other Sadly, and shouting at each other. Him, clearly. We probably, especially with the cheese round. But, um, we, we were. <laughs> That, that, I mean, to our poor listeners, the cheese round. Well, it was a... Cheese a, or disease round. Cheese it was disease. a cheese or disease round where there was like a close-up of molecules and stuff and you had to guess whether it was a disease or whether it was cheese. And um, it had one of the best quotes of the night, which was when Ed was like, it could be Stilton. Um, <laughs> which was one of my favorite moments. But but if, I think that, like, if you imagine that energy and that fervor around yes. a board game. Yes, and we've discussed the collective energy in the past yes, and yes. getting caught up in those moments. And I, I suppose the natural conclusion to this part is me saying that we should all go to a board game cafe someday because like now I feel like I'm missing out. Absolutely. It is all of that. I can't believe I hadn't sort of used that language myself from earlier. You know, it is about getting immersed and, and you know, you really get into it. It's fabulous. Yeah. And you, everything else is gone. It's just the game mm. and the people you're with. That, yeah. That wonderful cause... childlike <laughs> experience. Because it is that and thing you can of... do it during a power cut. Yeah. <laughs> Which was great in hurricane season. Um, but uh, when you have the group of people around you kind of half in it, then you're going to be half in it. But you don't mm. want to be the one person who's half in it when everyone is all in. Yes, because I'm sorry to Victoria, my wife, if she's listening to this, but she flags so early on in both games that it really takes the buzz <laughs> out. <laughs> I think she would admit this. So perhaps she could do with some... Uh, communal excitement as well because sometimes we've played board games as just the two of us and and then we just end up packing up because I think two gamers two two player games are harder you know it's, mm. I, I prefer four or five or six have you because you get that intensity yeah have you played Root no Oh, I would highly suggest it. It's a weird game, but it's that's the four-player game I was talking about. But it's this really interesting dynamic because there's four different factions, and they all are essentially playing a different game, but they all intersect. And it's so fast. I mean, just from from both an anthropological point of view and a gaming point of view, it's absolutely fascinating. Sounds good. Suggest Root. Root. <laughs> mm. Because... You were saying earlier about board games on games console. Monopoly is now on Nintendo Switch. And I've played Monopoly. I haven't bought it because it's 30 quid. 30 quid for Monopoly. Um, <laughs> outrageous. But That's what by the physical thing. Well, pre- the the car. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's, it's very tactile. And I like that. But, um, but yes, I've played Monopoly digitally. And it doesn't have the same excitement whatsoever. It just isn't the same. And I say that as a video game person. And I don't know if that's my nostalgia. Because I used to play Monopoly with my parents all the time. And it's just not the same. Because I don't get to feel the little top hat. I'm always the top hat. <laughs> Professor Plum and the top hat. There's an emergent that, that's, theme That's what I was about to say. Because Vivian says that so many of our conversations just ends with me saying, yeah, I was a pretentious ass back then. <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> this is another one of there's, those moments. There's so many moments where I'm just like, oh, this is basically just him having a pretentious moment. And any time that I want to gauge how pretentious I'm being, I always go, 
Alan, how do you feel about yes, we <laughs> this a, particular thing? Because we've discussed vinyl in the past. Yes, which on is... On that tactile front. The have you talked to Alan about vinyl? No, but I have the feeling I really should talk to him. You should definitely talk to Alan about vinyl. Because <laughs> I really enjoy vinyl, and I really enjoy the tactile side of it. I mean, because he's got his own record company. I, yeah, I'd heard that he's got a label. Yeah. So, yeah, that would be, be... And then, you know, he's just releasing slabs of, you know, 20 minutes of drone noise on some of the thickest vinyl known to humanity. I do it. Yeah, we've discussed thick vinyl, 180 gram vinyl, which yes, seems to have. be the standard now. But what's interesting about vinyl, just to mention for a moment, is that I didn't grow up with vinyl because my parents are convinced it's terrible because they had to grow up with it and it, it records would scratch and so forth. So then when CDs came along, they finally had a medium that wouldn't let them down. Yeah, because CDs never scratch. Well, <laughs> they are less problematic than vinyl is. But then I seem to have nostalgia for an era that I didn't even grow up in because I really enjoy listening to vinyl. And I don't know if that's because if the record does scratch, I know I think I can then just listen to it on Spotify later that day. I miss the ta- yeah, the tactility and the, just the artwork so much more satisfying, for example, yes. on, on, a, on a record. We're well off board games. Well, I was going to bring it back, yeah. because I, I think what you just mentioned was actually really interesting, which is the artwork. Because mm. I get drawn to games based on the artwork. Yes, um, and there's a really amazing game that you could play with two people, but it's much more fun with a group called Mysterium that is so good, and it's all just this beautiful artwork and it's one of my favorite games to play with a group primarily because of the art and that i just enjoy have you played mysterium i haven't but i've got a, 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 there's a game called suro which is a very good uh, sort of uh, after the pub game and it just it's a beautiful board and the packaging is all very beautiful and it's a very simple game there's no complex set of rules to understand and uh, you're just making lines through a board and forcing other people off the board. Um, and it's just a, a very, it's so simple, so beautiful, um, so, yeah, so satisfying. And each game only lasts a few minutes. It's very short, uh, but, it's, yeah, it's a lovely object. But I think, so there's something about aesthetics and the importance of aesthetics with board games, which, mm. I mean, we can talk about with other things as well, but yes. the fact that it's, it kind of needs to be present, I think, in, in board games, that you need that. Do you find that some board games could be frustrating to get through if they didn't look as good as they did? Because I've certainly well, had that with video games. <laughs> but, you know, Cuphead, for example, which is one of my favourite games of all time, is incredibly difficult, but it's all hand-drawn cartoons, so it looks beautiful, so you persevere with the difficulty of the game because of how great it looks. Whereas if that was an ugly game, as well designed as it is, if it was an ugly game, I never would have got to the end of it. I don't know if that says something about how superficial I am. <laughs> but but <laughs> but I mean, the aesthetic but the aesthetic, <laughs> just, <yeah. laughs> but the aesthetic is important, isn't it? So would you say there's some games that you just simply play because of how good it looks, or maybe not how good it looks, but I mean well, seems to be game designers invest an awful lot of time and money in making their boards and, and packaging and, and, and the experience as aesthetically pleasing as possible. I think a huge amount of time goes into that that dimension of it. And I think, you know, let's face it, there's a huge there's an explosion in, in people playing board games, you know, in the last few years. Um, um, and there's magazines devoted to talking about it, interviewing game designers. I think Senate is a, a, a nice little independent magazine talking about that kind of stuff. Uh, and yeah, uh, what it looks like, what it feels like to play, I think, are, are really important. Mm, quality of cards yeah. is important. If you, I mean, if it has card elements in it, obviously, but yeah, good quality top hat. <laughs> There's something I've been meaning to ask about Monopoly, by the way. I mean, I also played Monopoly a lot with my parents, but my parents never told me, or never used the game to tell me about the evils of capitalism, which is... You know, I think it just bleeds through game, naturally, doesn't it? <laughs> what the game is designed to do. Well, it was what it was designed to do, and then adopted by a capitalist organisation that changed it slightly, and then... 
monetize it. But then when you win, you do get the thrill of the bourgeoisie, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> you get to see what the appeal is for them. Now, Monopoly is a game where you know you're losing, and it is a slow bleed of death where you just want to go, I'm done. <laughs> just take it and leave. Which is quite similar to my to experience teach- of capitalism. <laughs> yeah, you could use it to teach so much. Let's face it, that's how it's felt to, to, to all of us for some time. <laughs> Yeah, the best player, the, the best role to have in Monopoly is the bank, right? That's what you want to be. Mm. You, I mean, you, you can win. sneak some money. <laughs> yeah. Loan, sir? Yeah. And buy me for. Yeah. Or, is or that it, the last one or the, the second? Dark blue. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so those, for our American listeners. Yes, those are the. Oh, so if you play Monopoly in the States, is it... They're, they're different properties. So in, in the States, it's based off of New York. Yeah, so that would be like really close mm-hmm. to Central Park or something. So it's Park Place and Boardwalk, yeah. I'd quite like that. I'd prefer New York to London. <laughs> I'm clearly in the minority there. <laughs> well, yeah, I don't know. I mean, what's really the difference? I guess the idea is that you recognise, or you would theoretically so recognise the places... For us. New York is a special place in my heart. But then I guess you wouldn't, I guess, therefore recognize the reference to crappier areas that are therefore oh, yes, cheaper yes. to the more progressive things. Because yes, I think when I see stuff with the London one, it's like, I don't know what this is. But then, <laughs> what I've, I but then I've also Let's enjoyed... Let's ignore the fact that I've lived here for like 10 years. I've but, also <laughs> enjoyed Game of Thrones Monopoly, and I've not been to Winterfell either. But you know the but places I've, I've better. Been, I've been there in... You, I guess the more important part is the references, I yeah? have been immersed in Winterfell. I guess it's more about the, the references. Yes. And so then you do acquire castles or something? Yeah, you, you, t- yeah, you seize keeps and King's Landing is, is the... Um, works. Is, I still don't know where Fenchurch Street Station is. <laughs> 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 well, I was born in Oh yes, I forget that you're a Londoner, no, but, but you're from, you're actually from Deeping. <laughs> <laughs> That's a UK joke for yes, all. Yes, yeah, you that is there. a niche joke. Well, that is a niche joke for niche people. That's not even a UK joke. That is a London joke. <laughs> oh no, Deeping isn't in London. Is it not? There you go. No, I, I so this is definitely a. Yeah. So that, that, that's why I know where it it's is. Sort of. Um, yes, it's where people in the past probably had webbed hands and feet. <laughs> Hence why Paul looks like he does. <laughs> I'm being very mean now, but I give as good as I. I mean, the vibe between these two, it, 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 yeah, it's great. It's great. <laughs> They're fast friends. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, well, I, I, I'm coming away from this really wanting to play a communal board game. So you should. That, that's what you should feel, I think. Um, but we should also want to leave this. Uh, and think, could we design a game? Now, have you given thought to how you would design a game? I, I've, all through my childhood and my adult <laughs> life, I've started to try and design a game and never finish the project because it's actually really hard. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, I, I, I'd love to design a game. So, yeah, I was about to say, have you, because I guess the, the you were talking about how you would potentially be able to use board games as a way of a teaching tool for teaching about religion. Have you seen religion implemented in a way that you like in board games? I mean, no. <laughs> That's fine. Um, but I think there are lots of board games. There's loads of board games about antiquity and the ancient world. There's loads of board games about developing civilizations and societies. There's board games about the pyramids, you know, the mummy, that game. And there's loads of stuff which takes has a takes a view or, or constructs religion in a particular way. Uh, it'd be great to make a game or consider making a game or commission a game that did something that helped people um, understand that religions are part of the world we live in and we need to understand them and um, improve our religious literacy and all that kind of stuff. I'm not being very articulate at the moment, but you know what I mean. Yeah. No, but this is picking up on a conversation that we had this afternoon about how sometimes something educational can be fun. And that doesn't Mm. mean that you dumb it down. Absolutely right. 
That, and uh, we were discussing using social media to teach people in amusing ways. Yeah, brilliant. I mean, you know, if there's, if there's interestingly different ways to, to, to do our teaching, uh, and not our just university teaching, but all, all levels, that's, that, you know, let's explore them, let's, let's do them. Now, I know that when we did the episode on world building, um, as I mentioned a specific podcast, which was very niche that, um, at the time, and I actually had a listener reach out to me suggesting a different podcast that had a, a different approach to religion. So if uh, there are, are lovely listeners that are um, more into different board games and you think that you have a board game that has approached religion in a really interesting, um, diverse, nuanced way, let us know and we'll critique it. We'll play it. <laughs> We'll definitely play as a group, as a collective group, to see if Alan suddenly likes board games. That, that would be great fun. And I probably will, because I, nom- I, I normally succumb to peer pressure. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if that's something that you want. What does that say about you? <laughs> I don't know if that's something that you want out there. But... No, that, that's a joke. But what I do, but I do enjoy, I, I do enjoy community events. I do. I, I do, I do, I do. I do believe in ghosts. <laughs> Little Wizard of Oz reference here. Yeah. Okay. I, I think that film came out shortly after you were born. Ah, uh, there we go. That's my last <laughs> insult. <laughs> and on that bombshell. If but people it, want to know more about you, Paul, and your work and what you're doing, is there some place that they can go? Yeah, I suppose they could visit uh, the Open University's web pages, and you can find me there in the Religious Studies Department. Um, I've got a page there which explores some of my interests and uh, some of my some of the teaching that I do and some of my stuff about my PhD students. And if you want to reach out, I'd be really happy to respond to any queries or questions. Um, yeah. Alan, if people want to know more about you and convince you to play a board game. If you want to convince me to play board games, come and find me on Twitter at L Thomas. And I'd like to add at this point as well that all ribbing aside, it is an absolute treat to have Paul on here. Because it there's is. been numerous times throughout various podcasts where I've referred to my supervisor. Well, I think well for we long-term actually... listeners, <laughs> Paul is that my supervisor that I've referred to. So I think we actually have linked to a couple of blog uh, blog posts that Paul has written the in Jedi our SM1, episode notes I think. previously. So if you have been very vigorous in reading our episode notes, you have read Paul's work. Yes, that's right. Yes, I remember that. Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> my, my sympathies go out to you. And Vivian, if people want to catch you online, where do they go? They can go to Twitter or Instagram. I am at Viviana Simos, and you can go to my blog, incidentalmythology.com. As Alid said, it has been an absolute pleasure, and we're very happy to have you here. It's been my pleasure to be here with you today. Really. Well, thank you for joining us, and thank you, Alid, for joining me, as always, despite the fact that I give you such a hard time all the time. Yes, yes, but do you know what the treat about today's episode was? There were no notes that I had to pretend to look like right. <laughs> <laughs> Let's just let everyone know how unprepared we are for you. You have mentioned several times that I'm terrible at looking at our notes, but fresh start. New academic here, fresh start. Does that mean you're going to read the notes? Yes. Okay. We'll revisit this in a month's time, but... We'll, we'll see how that goes. We'll see how that goes. Until next time. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye.